Hey folks, Kevin here. Well, it's January 28th, 2018. Uh, my voice is going to be a little bit off today uh, because I've got a sore throat, so bear with me, please. I want to go one step further in the lifestyle medicine uh, topic that I introduced uh, just yesterday, the day before. Hopefully I'll get this posted today. And uh, I want to talk about one resource that I use and why I use that resource. In previous videos, especially with the permanent raised bed gardens or building garden bed videos that, I, that I've created in the past, and I'll put a link up there for, for you to be able to see the garden ones. But this is builds, uh, this video I'm hoping builds on to or is an extension of the lifestyle medicine video. Uh, and the slides that I've created hopefully will bear that out. You'll see the, the relationship. But with those previous videos, I mentioned people like Elliot Coleman, Jean-Martin Fortier, and Curtis Stone. So Curtis Stone is the urban gar gardener, the, the urban, urban farmer. Uh, Jean-Martin Fortier is the, uh, the author of uh, The Market Gardener. And certainly, Elliot Coleman, uh, the author of several books, and you know the Four Season Gardening Systems, and all, and, and all of these have been these, all three of these individuals, as well as others. But these are key people that you can look at the references, and, and I'll put a link in the uh, video description down below for each of them uh, to see some of their books. However. Today I really want to expand on another resource that I use and I really want to always incorporate as much what I'm going to call peer-reviewed scientific information in each aspect. And you may remember the wheel that I showed uh, with lifestyle medicine. We'll revisit that briefly today as well. So this is a little bit of the, we're going to get into the who, what, where, when, why, and how aspects of, of how I approach things. So sit tight and let's start the presentation. The Daily Dozen, Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen Checklist. Important questions to ask include who, what, where, when, how, and why. And this all relates to using the scientific method and uh, how we go through evaluating potential you know, questions that we have and formulating a hypothesis and then uh, developing testable predictions and then gathering data and then refining, altering and or even rejecting our hypothesis and then generating generalized theories and then making further observations and going through the cycle. It's, it's a never ending cycle in science trying to discover what it is, how things tick. This is a reductionist approach and it's a very important arm of uh, medicine. It's a very important arm of all science-based uh, research. There's a, as you've watched so many of the videos, you'll see that many of my videos are instructional videos on how you yourself can do things. And down in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, there's that little green button that says own it. But what I'm talking about today is taking responsibility and choosing the right resources for you based on what your goals and objectives actually are. So when we ask these questions, uh, you know, who did, did the research? Who did they do it for? What, how was the, the, uh, the research funded? Uh, what was their hypothesis? What were their conclusions? Where was it done? Is it relevant? Is it pertinent? Uh, do, is it something that affects us? Uh, when was it done? Has there been further uh, research that's been done since this time? Is it further elucidation of, of factors that really weren't considered previously? How was it done? The study design uh, and so on. And most importantly, why was it done? Is there bias associated with, with the study? So why, why a specific approach? Uh, as a clinician, uh, in the past, people, uh, general practitioners would, would send cases to me uh, valuing uh, my expertise, either my advanced training or my, my experiences. 
and clients often w sought that information out. However, more important than expert opinion is non-bias, current, re relevant, and science-based proof that it is indeed the best information or technique available. We're always trying to, to find out what the science-based, evidence-based uh, research is going to tell us. Therefore, the expert opinion isn't nearly as valu valuable. There are so many papers produced each day. Diets are so confusing. So here we look, we can remember the food pyramids that were a, a thing of the past, and nowadays they have the food plate, the healthy eating plate. You look down here, you say, geez, Harvard Medical School, Harvard uh, School of Public Health. They're talking about increased activity. Half of the plate is fruit and vegetables. A quarter of the plate is whole grains and protein. They're talking about healthy proteins. So it looks really good. I would take issue with some of this because these are refined products. Some of these, the healthy oils that are here. And you know, there may be heavy metals in the fish and antibiotic resistant microorganisms in, in some of the poultry. <clears throat> However, I would say that it's made great great strides in the towards having a healthier based diet however there's a lot of corporate interest in in influencing uh what's put on this uh you know on this healthy eating plate um, recommendation so diets are so confusing previously i talked about vegan and vegetarian diets in in the ask me anything are you vegan and then we have all these weight control diets we have low ca calorie restricted diets, super calorie restricted diets, low carb diets, low fat diets. We've all seen these. Then there's the crash diets, the detox diets, the belief based diets. And so a vegetarian diet is in, in a sense, a belief based diet. Diets that fo follow medical uh, advice for various medical conditions. All of this is so confusing, it's frustrating. Uh, doctors tell you one thing you may watch on television, a doctor's show or Dr. Oz or Dr. Phil, whoever it may be that's, uh, who's very much interested or seems to go along with some of the, the current uh, diets that are being uh, reviewed and published in recent years. So. I like to go back and first think about what are our needs, separating those from our wants. And so I put the, the little icon up here of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now all of us don't have the benefit of, of really taking a close look at this and going above our, our safety and physiologic needs. If you're in a war zone and, and you're in, in the heat of battle, as some of our military are at times, well, you know, they're thinking about meeting their physiologic needs and their safety needs. And the people that they're thinking about are their brothers and sisters in battle. What about those, those individuals who aren't in the military, but their areas are in bombing zones and, and they're wor worried about all the other atrocities that are going on. So they don't have the luxury of most of us in the, in the uh, United States of being able to take into, to our, uh, into our goals and aspirations meeting all of these other needs. I like using uh, the wheel. I, 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 it's uh, a wonderful way of me thinking about things. One, historically it was uh, a, a tremendous advancement. It allows us to, it allowed us to move things smoothly and evenly. Uh, we know about this from watching the old uh, West movies, you know, Little House in the Prairie with the wagons. Uh, I also like it because when we look at these axles, it shows that all these, all these, uh, I'm sorry, we look at all the spindles that are mounted on the axle hub, all of these spindles, it's really important to have them of equal strength, equal length, otherwise the wheel wouldn't give us a smooth wide ride and it would break down. And I think of our, our uh, life, lifestyle medicine as being analogous to the wheel. Each one of the components that make up our, our lifestyle medicinal approach to, to living a healthy, long life are equally important. So 
Once we, we know what our needs are and we, we've identified our core values, we can list out our, our goals. And as you've seen before, we've talked about all these various elements or facets of a healthy, healthy lifestyle, and so all equally important. So today we're going to journey down a little, start the journey into the nutrition uh, uh, aspect of the element of this important wheel of life. So here we go. So where do we turn? Well, at this point, I'm going to go to Dr. Greger's nutritionfacts.org. So I'm at the website and I'm going over to the left top of the screen, going down the video library, going down to the introductory videos and clicking on that. And I'm going to scroll down through several videos which are really good. The story, the uh, why you should care about nutrition, taking personal responsibility for your health. But important, I think, is the philosophy of nutritionfacts.org in another video. I'm often asked what my opinion is about the one food or another. I know what they're saying, but you know, I'm not interested in opinions. I'm not interested in beliefs. I'm interested in the science. What does the best available balance of evidence published in the peer-reviewed medical literature show right now? For trivial decisions in life, it doesn't matter. Uh, want a new toaster? Get a shiny one, or get the pretty one, or get the one your friend likes, or the one recommended by some stranger on the internet. Right? How much does it really matter? Right? But what we eat on a day-to-day -day basis is the number one determinant of our health and longevity. Uh, it's, it's one of the most important decisions of our lives. In fact, the three most important decisions of our lives may be what to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, we're talking about the health of our families. What could be more important? Right? These are literally life or death decisions, yet when I ask people why they eat what they do, I get, oh, I uh, you know, read something online or I heard about this new diet at the gym. That's like, it's like asking a parent on some family skydiving trip why they're folding everyone's parachutes in some weird new fashion and getting an answer like, well, I heard about this, um, some fad, you know, where, you, you know, like your blood type A, you got to fold it. I mean, if there's anything in life that we should demand evidence for, it should be that which affects the health and well-being of ourselves and our families. I mean, if there's anything to put a little critical thought into, it should be what we eat on a daily basis. So when I or anyone else says anything about something as life and death important as diet, your immediate response should be, show me the science. None of us were born with this information. Where did we find it? And don't just tell me the source, show me the source. Uh, that's why, you know, you look at my videos, I don't just talk about the science, I show you the science. I don't just cite a study, I show you the study, the actual graphs, tables, figures. I don't just share a quote or conclusion, I show you the quote. And then you can click on the Sources Cited button next to every video and get a list of links to all the sources I used. Uh, so you can download the PDFs, read the studies yourselves, make sure I didn't you know, take anything out of context. When it comes to critical life-altering decisions, uh, it's not enough for some expert to just cite their sources. They should give you their sources so you can make up your own mind. I'm often asked how long it takes me to come up with one of my daily videos. Once the script is done, it doesn't take more than like 10 hours to create and record it. It's the research phase that takes the most time. I don't think people understand how much work that takes. So I wanted to kind of pull back the curtain and give everyone a little sneak peek. If you go to PubMed.gov, we can access the database of the National Library of Medicine, the largest medical library in the world. You can search for topics like diet or nutrition, and you'll see that there's about 100,000 papers published every year in the field of nutrition in the scientific medical literature. Uh, that's more than 200 studies a day. I can't read 200 studies a day, but 20 people could read 200 studies a day. That's why I hired 19 researchers 
to help me plow through the literature so you don't have to. And that's in addition to an army of volunteers downloading and categorizing nearly 2,000 articles a week. Uh, I don't want to miss a single important paper. Uh, then the next step is to look for what I call anchor articles. These are the new studies around which I construct the videos. And I'm looking for novelty, practicality, and engagement. Is it groundbreaking? If it's just another study showing that broccoli is good for you, unless there's some new insight, probably won't make the cut. Is it practical? I mean, is there some actionable information that can be used to make a real-world kitchen or grocery store decision? You know, who cares if there's some, you know, new whortleberry with medicinal properties that can only be forged, you know, wild in the Siberian tundra or something? Right? And finally, is there a way to make it interesting? That's actually probably the, the greatest limiting factor. There's lots of trailblazing new science with you know, hands-on implications, but unless I can find a way to to make it captivating, to add humor or intrigue or solve some mystery, sadly, it just kind of goes by the wayside. Uh, that's why that's something we need like 10 different sites like this so we can, you know, I can just pass those papers along and be like, you try to make that interesting. Right? Hey, once I have the anchor, uh, then the real work begins. I mean, just because something is published in the peer-reviewed medical literature doesn't mean it's true. I mean, there are studies funded by the National Confectioners Association that finds that candy is just dandy. Studies covertly funded by Coca-Cola, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a flawed study, but you have to give it that extra level of scrutiny. You always have to follow the money. Then you have to put the study in context. For all I know, that new study is some outlier or fluke. Maybe there's 10 other studies out there that show the exact opposite. How else can we make life or death decisions for ourselves and our families but by the best available balance of evidence? That's why you know, every new study needs to be placed into context. Easier said than done. Uh, for example, let's say this paper lands in my inbox arguing that fish oil increases the risk of cancer. You know, I could just make a video about it, just laying out the facts. There was this paper published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal that presented evidence that taking fish oil increases the risk of cancer. Here's the paper. Here's the link to download the paper. Here's all the evidence they present in black and white right in front of you. Here's their reasoning, their graphs, their charts, their diagrams. This is the peer-reviewed medical literature, people. Done. No, that's not good enough. That doesn't answer the most important question of all. Is it actually true? For all we know, this guy is just you know, cherry-picking studies to fit some agenda. It's not enough for us to just stick to the peer-reviewed science. I want everything on nutritionfacts.org to reflect the best available balance of evidence. Okay, so how do I figure that out? Well, even if his arguments make sense based on the evidence he provides, you have to make sure he's interpreting the evidence he cites correctly. Uh, to do that, you have to pull all the 76 sources he cites to make sure he's not misquoting anything. And what if each of those 76 papers cites 76 other papers? And even if he correctly cited those 76 papers, what about all the papers he didn't cite? There have been more than 2,000 papers published on fish oil and cancer. And look, this paper was published back in 2013. Uh, what about the papers that have been published subsequently that cited this particular paper? And that's just one paper for one video, right? You'll be glad you did your due diligence, though, because then you'd realize, hey, that fish oil paper got retracted. Why? Because the researcher evidently failed to disclose he owned his own supplement company, which sold a competing oil supplement. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean something's amiss, but definitely requires additional scrutiny. So anyway, bottom line, ideally, we do a comprehensive search of the available literature to place any particular paper in context, while also going backwards and forwards in time to checking all the sources they cite and all the sources that cited them, and then we do that any time a paper is published on nutrition, which, again, happens a mere 100,000 times a year. Now, hopefully you can appreciate why we had to bring on 19 researchers. How can we afford to do that, though? I mean, 
I don't take any salary or compensation. We have nearly 200 active volunteers who also donate their time, but we also have seven paid operations staff, tech, design, development, social media, volunteer coordination. Right? How can we afford to pay two dozen salaries plus the server costs and everything else? You. NutritionFacts.org is a 501c3 nonprofit charity that exists exclusively on donations from individuals like you. It's like a, a Wikipedia model of just accepting donations from users who appreciate the content, who appreciate what we're doing. We reach so many millions of people that if you know, one in a thousand makes a small contribution, we're able to continue to thrive. So if you feel like my work has enriched your life, please consider supporting us by making a tax-deductible one-time or even better monthly donation. Regardless, even if you never give a penny, everything on the website is and will always be free for all, for all time. There's no members-only area where you can get additional life-saving information for a price. Uh, there are no advertisements of any kind. We don't accept corporate sponsorships. Site's strictly non-commercial. There's no line of Dr. Greger's brand snake oil wonder supplements. Even all the money I get from my books and DVDs all go straight back into the site. It's just a public service for those hungry for evidence-based nutrition. So I hope you found uh, listening to Dr. Gre Gregor explain those two important topics of some value. I find it very valuable. It, it ensures a greater sense of confidence that if we're getting non-biased, evidence-based, scientifically uh, factual information. And we get more insight into how his team of experts go about uh, s sorting through that tremendous volume of nutritional uh, peer-reviewed scientific literature and present the information to us. So that's something that I've, I've relied on for the last few years since using Dr. Greger's site. So Dr. Greger also has, and I've mentioned uh, these two books before, uh, first his website is nutritionfacts.org listed above. Uh, the first book that he came out with that I'm aware of is How Not to Die, an absolutely excellent uh, book that's broken down into the three uh, components, part one and part two, and then the third part is all of the uh, citations, and they're, they're listed in a way that's very easy to identify. But as you just saw in the videos, you can go through his website, click on the video, and then click on the peer-reviewed um, I'm sorry, pick, pick, click on the actual citations and pull them up for yourself. So those are really good if you needed to bring th those citations into uh, your doctor's office for them to review as well. Hopefully you have a relationship with your physician, clinician uh, that's, that's mutually beneficial. Then the next book is How Not to Die Cookbook. We haven't had that for very long. It looks really promising. We've got multiple resources for whole food plant-based cooking now and we do a lot of it or Thea does lots of experimenting at this point as well and then on the right here is the daily dozen now this is something I'm going to go into a, a bit further here really it's a it's a uh, checklist of uh, food components that people are always asking Dr. Greger well what do you eat uh, what do you recommend and so we broke it down into beans, berries, other fruits, veg, you know, cruciferous vegetables, other fe vegetables, greens, flaxseed, you know, all of the, the various components, uh, recommended servings, and so on. And you can download this app either for your iOS device or for your Android device. So uh, the daily dozen uh, work through, as you can see on the left-hand side over here, we've got you know the beans the berries the fruits the cruciferous vegetables all the everything listed down here including even beverages and exercises and uh, then the number of, of servings each, each day so we have three servings of beans each day one serving of berries three servings of other fruits and this would seem absolutely overwhelming to the standard American diet uh, all American you know meat and potato steak and egg guys at first 
but you can pack so much into uh, into a smoothie or just a simple breakfast, one meal. So many of these things can go into because they're not large portions. There's uh, and you're getting a full complement by using a checklist like this, at least getting started. That you're getting all of those important micronutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the phytonutrients. And over here is another way of looking at it. And the, uh, of course, you can always choose the other alternative, the standard American diet and the bonus gift that comes along later. So here we go. We can look at, uh, I've, I've gone ahead and on three PowerPoint slides here, this is the first one. We're just looking at, well, the beans, the category on, on the far right, then examples of some of the beans that Dr. Gregor uh, put in here. I did put down a couple of ours, the Scar Scarlet Runner beans and the Trail of Tears. And then over here on the, the left hand side, the servings, three servings a day. Well, how much is a serving? Well, a quarter cup of, of uh, hummus or a bean dip, a half a cup of cooked beans or one cup of fresh pe peas or sprouted lentils. You know, and you can just go down through this list. It, it's it's helpful to get to get ideas. We're trying to get to the point where we're using uh, minimally processed, either just cleaned and frozen, and put away. And and you can have these as healthy alternatives to all those packages that we're all used to picking up in the grocery store. And then we go down to the you know the flax seeds, the nuts and seeds, the herbs and spices the whole grains and the beverages, and we've got quite a few different teas here, and certainly water uh, is, is an important one. And five servings a day, that's not including the, wa the water that's in your uh, vegetable smoothies and all that, unless you're adding water to them. And then some of the exercise uh, suggestions as well. So I find his list to be very useful, not just, well, most people would probably use this as their daily checklist of, you know, what they might want to uh, pick up at the grocery store to have on hand for their three meals a day for the family. So how do we use this information? Well, we select the appropriate plants for us to grow based on what it is that, 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 that has that full complement of micronutrients and we really want a nutrient dense food so that more nutrient uh, bang for the for the caloric buck more bang for your buck so that's how we look at it so what are we going to grow well in our food forest we have we select the plants that we want to grow in our food forest in our per, rest of our perennial crops our market garden our kitchen garden and the nursery stock that we have for sale as well as the we determine what foods we're going to need to buy and we also, it's very important in how we're gonna prepare, serve, and store the foods so that we're always prepared and ready for just about any event. We're, we, are, we wanna enhance uh, food sovereignty, uh, growing foods locally. Um, and, you know, certainly you know what's in the food if it's coming from your own garden. You have a better idea of knowing what's in your food if it's coming from, let's say, a, um, uh, community supported agriculture uh, so your local farmer and so it's it's knowing what you're getting for for what you're bringing into your household and based on peer-reviewed scientific literature and there's the out there in the raspberry patch uh, picking raspberries for all winter long so I want to thank you for staying with me through this video uh, please subscribe, share the video with your friends, be sure to, to, to like it, and I would really appreciate it if you'd leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this video, if, the, if you think you want more like this video. There are many topics uh, spanning this realm of lifestyle medicine that I'm very interested in. So thanks so much folks, I really appreciate it, and have a wonderful day. Bye bye now.